This is Welcome Church Radio, a podcast of the Welcome Church of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm your host, Polly. Y'all, we got a great one. This is our premiere episode. I am so excited to bring this conversation to you. We are talking about Healing Chocolate Chip Cookies, the resource guide from the Welcome Art Ministry. I got on the podcast with me Rachel Gutswa, the coordinator of the Welcome Art Project, and Pastor Shawnell, the co-pastor of the Welcome Church. We had an incredible conversation about the resource guide, about the incredible things that the Welcome Church community are putting into it, how it all came to be, and what the ministry of the Welcome Church is and how it's different from other ministries who claim to be doing the same thing. So without any further ado, here's our chat. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. morning. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, Rachel, you've done a lot of work in compiling um, the book. Can uh, Can you tell me about where the idea came from? I'm like the art coordinator for the Welcome Church and do the art ministry. And we, you know, we've done a lot of great programs through the years with art and like cooking arts and you know just the art of like building community and I was just putting together like a resource idea of like you know like kind of like how to make this happen and then I like realized that the heart of what the welcome church does is like hospitality Mm. and any program that like supports people by making it more of a welcoming space and a welcoming community, you're going to get better results. So this book kind of mm-hmm. came out of like my real, like I've heard the saying, but I don't think I made the connection of that idea of making the shift from feeding people to sharing food. And I think that's a major component of the welcome church that unfortunately seems to be kind of unusual but it seems like very basic hospitality and humanity to me Hmm. i want to dwell more on that idea of the trend you 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 use the turn of phrase um transitioning from um, feeding people to sharing food um what can you can you say more about what that difference is there's a lot of amazing organizations that feed people throughout the city and they give them sandwiches and you know they give them what you know socks and it's important and it's meaningful because people need to be clothed and fed Mm -hmm. but by actually making space at the table for everyone like you know I might give you a sandwich but I need to eat also and like by us eating together it changes the narrative from one of like like a power dynamic to one of like um we're more on equal footing like we're just both people trying to make it and so sharing food is what's going to we both need need to be fed so why don't we eat together why why not eat together the the issue that i hear in what you said is the the issue of power and how power impacts relationships Shanel, I wonder if you can say, when you think about power and the ministry of the Welcome Church, it feels, frankly, different than than some ministries that I've been involved with in the past. That seems intentional, don't you think? That, like, there's a lot of care around how power is used in, in Welcome Church ministry. Well, I'll definitely affirm everything Rachel was just saying, that we have, that Welcome Church has sought to be very intentional about opening a table in which there is space for everyone to share whatever it is they have to bring, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in whatever that day that, or that period of their life or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that has been both, you know, concrete things where literally there's some kind of food on a table and somebody else produces something out of a bag or whatever, another part of food to help, complement the meal or whatever it is that's being created and then also just you know um whatever it is that people bring there have been various people who've 
joined us at our Bible studies, and one of them was a good friend of Rachel's, I'll say. People who come and they bring music, like singing music. Um, um, And um, whatever it is that they bring, we definitely try to leave space for that when we worship on the parkway together. Yeah. Um, To, uh, obviously, one person has been asked to preach for the day, but no matter what they put in their notes, they might not know what is going to arise from the group, what, what additions and thoughts. And I think that, um, you know, is very well accepted by the people. Um, sp- thinking about power, obviously the power of choice is huge to give to people that, you know, if you have a life that's, you know, um, due to a variety of factors, in, in a you know very controlled by a system that says you know this is when you have to be back to your shelter and this is when we when this is when this group is at this street corner hand, handing out meals or whatever and that's the only way you're going to have shelter and get a meal your your ability to make choices has been so constrained and so giving people the power of choice you know is as frequently as possible or in whatever means you can get that put together um and you know, obviously, I see a lot that a lot in Rachel's work as far as, you know, when she presents an art project, there's a lot of ability to 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 choose how it's going to turn out for the for the doer, and um, but that's an important step in people being able to put their lives back together because if people you know think that they have no control in their lives, you know, it will be hard for them to think about what are the next steps I need to take but giving people the power of choice I think help and and giving them the 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 the, you know the the fair credit that yes you can you know uh you know make choices about what's important in your life it's 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 just it's fundamental to again who we are as people and how we can you know move forward in any way in our lives and acknowledging whatever the people bring to the table like what Shana was saying is so important in helping people kind of get their life back together and feel like they have power in transforming their life and making it a life that you know they're proud of and they're happy and so just like acknowledging whatever it is that people bring to the table whether it's music whether it's like a physical item or whether it's just like you know the person who like looks out for other people or like I remember Um, someone who called herself the street nurse and she took care of people when they were sick. And I think her background was in nursing, but she, she, they, other people referred to her too as a street nurse. And what she could give was like compassion and like some sort of like medical sensitivity to people in need. And Hmm. I remember being very touched by her identifying that way and also her sharing that, part of her personality so freely with other people. What are some things we can be doing in ourselves to help ourselves get better at sharing? So this is when we started talking about power. Um, Recently, someone said something in my presence, which I have heard variations of before, but it really hit me a lot more powerfully, or I understood it more powerfully than I'd ever heard understood it before, just about how we do have to learn to or work to or accept the the change in our lives of of giving up a certain amount of power in order to accept something from somebody Mm. it's it's very you know um i think we're often we're more comfortable if we sort of here i brought what you need today and because i control that completely i put it on the table again if that's you know what and food's a very easy thing to work with Mm. thinking that but you could expand Mm. that and um, the person who was saying this was specific, you know, specifically using the example of sometimes, you know, churches go on mission trips to both other countries and probably other places in on their own neighborhood. Sure. And it's a, I, I, it's a big thing when the group there, that other place you go makes a meal and you're like, well, why are they making me a meal when I came to, <laughs> I mean, that, when I came to help and And I have heard that laid out to me so many times and I've even, you know, lived that, but just recently really striking me with the idea of power in that, that it kind of makes you confront the power dynamics when you realize 
you need to, you know, even in that small context, you need to give up power. You just need to kind of live into it and let the person share what they have to share. Um, And I think that's probably eye-opening to other places where, you know, um, there's differences of power where we need to be intentional about giving up, you know, somehow readjusting the power dynamic, which is a nice, I mean, give up power, which is a lot more, (laughs) <laughs> scary and in face you know in your face language but you know there's something that's so like biblical about that i think jesus gave up the gave up so much power to become like human right like still still divine still god but to take on the the body the experience of being human took on the limitation of being a mortal, like not eternal body of like flesh and bone. So I want to, I want to pivot us a little bit to the book, the book. So the title of the book is Healing Chocolate Chip Cookies. Rachel, can you tell me a little bit more, like why, why Healing Chocolate Chip Cookies? So this little resource guide, all right, it's not little, it's like 700 pages, <laughs> but this little, little resource, <laughs> <laughs> this little resource guide kind of came about thinking about the important work the Welcome Church has done and also the fact that we were missing it so much because of COVID. Like yeah. as a re- result of COVID, we haven't been able to get together like we used to and Prior to the pandemic, we were having monthly gatherings and we were really creating a very strong and supportive community of people. As a requested by participants, we were doing a specific programming geared towards supporting women. We were doing a art program and a cooking program, and it really was like amazing how much through these programs, everybody, like including us, we were all participants in these programs, were coming together and like kind of creating this like really beautiful intentional community and it would be like great like we would do like we would make whatever we were making and people would like be like shaking spices in and like knowing how to cook all these things and like cooking like their grandmother and like talking very casually and comfortably and like it was like a the kitchen and the table are like very natural places for coming together sure and it was just great. And then the women would help each other go leave the church, which was very always touching to me because they carried a lot of stuff and they would help each other like holding the doors or passing bags through the doors or helping each other down the stairs and like being very aware of one another. And I really miss that coming together during the pandemic so this book kind of came about kind of like remembering the good old days but like I thought what we were doing was so important it was really making a difference in the lives of all of us like I felt different I mean I don't think of myself as an artist and like somehow I'm doing this art program every week and it was like it was very empowering to me, but it also felt like it was powerful for the everybody. Like people were like coming out of their shell in a way that was very natural and like very nor- organic. It wasn't forced. It was just like an authentic interaction, an authentic relationship. So I started just doing like a resource guide of like, you know, s- we were doing really simple recipes that didn't require a lot of ingredients and didn't require a lot of like money. Like they were basic recipes and, you know, and then people doctored them up as they wanted to. And I was like, oh, I'll just do that. And then I was just like kind of doing like the little art projects and like adding like a little therapeutic twist to them or whatever. But then it was like a revelation to me, the idea of what the, what we were doing. It wasn't just like arts and cooking. It was I mean, when you say it like that, it sounds almost trivial, but it, what we were doing wasn't trivial. We were making people feel welcomed and we were like making people feel seen exactly as they are and valued exactly as they are. And I realized like that's was important. Like, I don't know why it's such a foreign concept, but what we were doing was authentic and valuable. And that helped guide this 
like resource guide a, a lot that realization that doing something like sharing food with people or sharing art activities or sharing time with people that changes the narrative. I know I'm very much looking forward to us all being together again because I thought the spaces we created together were really sacred. I'm thinking about like creating creating sacred space because I, I think that that's like one of the hallmarks of the Welcome Church, right? That wherever we are, the work that we do is to help create sacred space, wherever that might be. Like, um, Pastor Sean, you've been doing this work for, for some time, even before the Welcome Church. What are the sorts of things that are helpful in creating sacred space? And what are the things that can, can take away from that work? One of the things definitely that helps is uh, the use of names, calling people, you know, getting to know people's names mm. and use, using their names and, you know, use, and calling people the name that they ask to be called. Mm. That's big. I think that, you know, has obviously, you know, you could find biblical citations to help say why that's a good idea or why that's, you know, why that is a sacred act. I love this idea, just hearing you say it just now, Polly, of, you know, the Welcome Church makes a variety of spaces sacred by, you know, by <laughs> by venturing out into them and, and, and claiming that. Years ago, when the Pope came to Philadelphia, we had a blessing of the Parkway service, be, like the week before the Pope came. But just the acknowledgement that this is sacred space because it's where people, you know, people live here. It's, um, it's you know, people. There's people who are making the parkway their home, and so th- you yeah. know, it, it's it's sacred space just by the fact that people are there. Thinking of so many wonderful stories while Rachel is talking about just the wonderful work she does with us, but um, how we would do. Uh, Sanctuary Angels, of course, pre-pandemic, on the um, on the same you know, on Tuesdays, the same day we had were doing Bible study, and I guess you know there were times Rachel would be at the Bible study and times she wasn't at the Bible study, but she would um, you know bring a certain art project for that day, for the women to for us to do together, and she would ask a question to sort of just enter a, uh, enter us into thought, and it was always like oh you know that's the same thing we were talking <laughs> about in Bible study today. <laughs> Just so frequently. That did happen a lot. That did, you know, and yeah. so, um, they also, that's sort of like, you know, freaky stuff that you can't explain. <laughs> you know? But, but the, you know, um, yeah, I think a, a wonderful lesson, I think, that keeps being reinforced to me is that that's, again, I think, you know, very biblical is that everything is, that's real is not, um, you know, this table is real because I can do this to it, you know, but. <laughs> But maybe it's just because I can that doesn't make it real. And that people and yeah. and I see I I see people out on the streets, and I you know we make certain judgments about people based on you know what they look like. Oh, obviously that person doesn't have a job or whatever because they, cause they sure. don't know how to dress right. You know whatever we make these different judgments about people, but we really you know but there's all realities of people that we don't see, and those I think until we're able to see, you know, when we see them, we realize how much more real those realities are than, than the, that we thought this, the physical reality is. So I think keeping an openness to these spiritual realities that we can be, you know, that a conversation can continue when the people weren't there and that people have realities, that people have these incredible gifts that I never saw because I never opened up my eyes to see them. Yeah. One of the reasons I fell in love with the Welcome Church is when the Pope came to Philadelphia, like Shauna was just saying. We are talking, like, just side note, we are talking about Pope Francis in 2015, as opposed to Pope John Paul, like, way back in the no, 70s. No, no, right? 2015. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was a lot younger you then. Know? <laughs> <laughs> I like, might have been a zygote at that time. <laughs> pope, who was the Pope now? I think it was, pope like, John like Paul. Pope, pope John Francis. Paul. Pope, pope Francis. Pope Francis pope, in pope, 2015. I'm sorry. Yeah, so when I Pope not, Francis yes. came to Philadelphia I mean there were billions of people on the parkway but the welcome church shows up they show up even when the pope is in town praying on their 
church. <laughs> like, and I remember finding them in this crowd of people, and they're like, we do services on Sunday on the parkway. We're going to pray with, the, with people who show up. And the Pope was there, and they were showing up, and it was... It was amazing and really like making a sacred space like that. The parkway is a sacred space because people live there, like Shannel said, not just because the Pope was there. These people live there all the time. But the fact that the Welcome Church showed up <laughs> when the Pope was showing up really was pretty impressive to me. That's an amazing story. <laughs> I just, I, I, I love that, <laughs> that, that like in this giant sort of like gathering, there's, there's a sub gathering. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like they were it's competing true, services. <laughs> it was just like the welcome church is consistent. They show up when they say yeah. they're going to show up and where they're going to show Which up. Which is another really great, I mean, this is a fascinating question. Like, how do you live out what you believe? I mean, um, yeah. just to flesh out these details. If you want to know when the worst weather of the month is going to be, except for this Sunday, it's going to be 80-something, but I'd also scratch the theory. But if you want to know when the worst Sunday of the month, the worst weather of the month is going to be, look to the Sundays that the Welcome Church is on the parkway always here. And one Sunday when it was like whatever drizzly rain, you know, Violet was already out. We had gotten to the city a little before I had, I guess. And I came and she already had, you know, she had $5 in her hand or whatever. And one of the guys had had, you know, said to her, was out on the bench and said, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so said you weren't going to be here. But I said, I said, now that, you know, that, that they always show up, they'll be here. Yeah. And and he said, now you take this $5 and you go get yourself some tea. Because it's, you know, <laughs> but just, just, we are, I mean, there's only like, we're, the, we're known as the people who show up. And that's, I think, you know, yeah, claiming that sacredness. I'm fresh enough out of seminary to remember a few things and one of the sound bites that always got thrown around was the ministry of presence if there's anything that i'm aware of certainly it feels like like sacred presence and i want to tie that into one of the things that keeps coming back is this idea that the parkway is sacred because people live there and if we take that like a step further then there's a certain sacredness to any space that a person calls home, right? So I'm wondering, how can more spaces feel more sacred? I feel like there are a lot of spaces that we don't necessarily think of as sacred, but if, if the definition of what is sacred is some, some place, regardless of what type of building or not building that it is, if it's a place that someone calls home, how do we recognize more places as sacred? That's sort of, I mean, that's the question of questions, I think, for the Welcome Church. I, I, I mean, it's an, it's an amazing question. Um, we, we just did Stations of the Cross in the uh, suburban station this right. past you know, whenever uh, Good Friday, and when we had done a walkthrough before we did the Stations of the Cross to kind of know what our stops would be, yeah. we saw that people are writing graffiti on the walls of Suburban Station, but like a good, you know, two-thirds percentage at least of the graffiti is people writing prayers, in both in like every kind of pencil and Sharpie, you know, both you know, dip whatever that, you know, and, um, listeners at home can't see it, but like my mouth is a gape. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my God, that's, that's beautiful. So people are claiming the sacredness of their space and sort of saying, if you won't give me anything else, I'm going to put it right here. Mm. So that just, I mean, in that sense, it's that, um, much a part of human nature or whatever to claim human, human, to claim, sacredness or to say damn it listen to me or whatever yeah we have known so many people and rachel was talking about some of the women and stuff who helped to make home for one another you know help to make mm. you know create you know create safety or safe spaces for one another and um that's sort of to us that's that's why that's the big i mean we opened a women's shelter the well because there was no yes. safe place for the women to go at the same time, there's women who have sort of not been, who haven't been able to stay at the well just for, you know, a variety of personal reasons. It hasn't sure. worked out. But how do we create a society 
where there's space for everybody, even if whatever is going on in their own life right then that they can't be indoors. And ha so, I mean, what does it look like to have a safe society for people? Now, obviously, Suburban Station right now is not doing a great job <laughs> on that in that they've, they've made it so sanitized in the midst of the pandemic that it's really, yeah. it's not somewhere where people can hang out anymore. Now, the argument, I think, on the other side is that, well, it's not safe for people when people are hanging out there. But how do we achieve a society where there's space for people, no matter what their needs are at the time? And I think, Chanel said, like, claim sacredness. So I think the Welcome Church is dedicated, and people are dedicated to creating sacred spaces. But it's also, like, there's a commitment to like this idea of holding space like mm. welcoming someone as they are like creating a kinder community begins like with you know interactions like one-to-one -one interactions like treating people with respect exactly as they are and whatever they're where they are in life like just mm. by acknowledging them by name and respecting the gifts that they bring to the table and willingly or even like with time are willing to share by holding space for someone you're opening up this like opportunity for sacredness like holding space for someone and creating sacred spaces is so big and it's so intentional so it's like you screw up all the time and then you try again to be better and like to be more present and to be more um honest like with yourself and with someone else as like a fellow human a fellow like magical being on this like journey and you just at the for whatever reason you're at this moment in time together mm. so i think the welcome church is really dedicated to both of these things like this idea of creating space or creating sacred spaces and holding sacred space for one another Coming back to the resource guide, the book, for the people who are already connected to the Welcome Church, whose ideas, lives make up the content of this resource guide, of this book, how do you think Healing Chocolate Chip Cookies contributes to this work of creating sacred space and holding space for them? And what is your dream for it for people who, who might not yet be connected with the Welcome Church? Well... My vision for the book is that more organizations and more like people just kind of realize it's not hard to make big changes. I mean, it takes a you know consistency and showing up and learning someone's name, but like with I think the activities and the recipes, they're very basic. Like they're just like kind of like building box for just building communities and strengthening relationships, like creating this openness for compassion and for like empathy for one another. So I think it doesn't, it could be the welcome church. It could be anybody who works with other people, which is probably everybody, everybody interacts with someone else. Mm. Yeah. Finding a way to hold that person as like a sacred being as they are. It's not hard. It just, you just got to kind of be committed to that value or that openness to that unique person and their experiences. Yeah, no, the, the only word that, you know, we started using a little bit was contextualization that people mm. can read the story of, of what, you know, a little bit what has been done before by one group of people. Yeah. And they can s say, gee, this, you know, this is, um, here's how I might take this idea and apply, you know, I can tweak it a little and apply it to my own setting. But just so giving sure. people the, the wealth of the experience of what we've been able to do and learn and just give people, a, you know, a way to, you know, have access to that so that they can, you know, take, take what they ca are able to and, you, you know, that's helpful in their setting or what they can adapt in their setting. So it's to get those tools out there to people. We've done the focus of a lot of these activities in the book with women, just with the acknowledgement that specifically to Philadelphia, women are outnumbered four to five times to men on the street. 
and there's less resources available for them. So they're looking at those additional vulnerabilities and they're focusing on building community among the people who are the most vulnerable. So again, asking people, you know, how would how would this work out in your situation? Like in another situation, you know, someone might be working with a you know different group of people, but just asking the question of, you know, what are the vulnerabilities and how do we share our resources in those settings? And like the therapeutic and like the spiritual like connections that you can make, whether it be through Bible study or if you're like working with someone in more of a therapeutic relationship it's not like a how-to guide it's like a suggestions of like this worked for us and these are ideas that you could easily incorporate into your programming to like build on your programming and also to build on the power of your programming a lot of the shelters and different communities I've worked in there's still a sense Maybe it's back to what we were talking about at the beginning about power, the unequal distribution of power or marginalization of people. Mm. This was a guide of a program that worked really well for us. But I really think the activities was like almost secondary. What really worked for us was we treat people with respect and they come back because they feel like they are valuable. Mm. And by encouraging their own sense of validness in a world that puts spikes on benches so people can't sleep on a bench or can't go to the bathroom valuing a person just for their basic humanity that they exist they exist and are there can change the nature of any sort of social programming yeah we give people back power we're just like an instrument for giving people back power and like control in their life and helping them to feel empowered to make change or to create the life that they want. Hmm. I'm remembering how in Suburban Station, like one of the recent renovations in Market East as well, all of the public toilets are now behind like pay turnstile. Exactly, yes, yeah. Like going to the bathroom is a crime. Being homeless is a crime. Poverty is a crime. You may only use the bathroom if you're, if you have a, if you're a paying SEPTA customer. So, uh, you know. (laughs) A couple final thoughts. What is been the most life-giving part of your ministry with the Welcome Church? Or if it's dif- if it's too difficult to narrow it down to one, um, what's one in particular that, that sticks out? I have been form- formally, f- formally <laughs> an employee of the Welcome Church <laughs> since 2013, so yeah, it's going on a while. Sure. But just the, for this whole period of time, it, you know, going home from work can be very hard. It's it just it can be very emotional. Just and and it's sort of the only. And I don't want to boil it down to any one thing, but I mean the one thing that it might is just sort of like, yeah, that I just leave people. It's like you know, okay, everyone go home now. That's right. You don't have one. Oh well, <laughs> well I do. <laughs> um, but just that real. <laughs> You know, I, I, the, the Welcome Church being a, a, a Lutheran congregation, so it's very grounded repeatedly in this, you know, Lutheran theology of we're all sinners begging at this for crumbs from the same table, and just that very humbling. It makes me look at a lot of part of myself. This, is, yeah, that I could, I can hide behind a lot of degrees and things, but. Really, you know, I mean, the people I meet are so incredible mm. that, 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 that uh, I always think of humility as a very fascinating concept because it's both, you know, it means you don't think so much of yourself, but then the flip side is it really, it just means that we're all in this together. That perhaps is the best thing that comes out of that, that just the, the seeing other people's gifts, the being amazed by, uh, by all the amazing people I meet and the little bit of trying to figure out why doesn't everybody else see this every day? I'm always taken and humbled by the Welcome Church and the people I meet who are brave enough to tell their story to me and like share their life with me. I find it incredibly brave and it makes me want to be braver I'm very taken with when people take care of one another. And I might be biased because this kid shares my birthday, 
but this little girl, they had a um, baby shower for this little girl, well, for this lady who was having a baby, the Welcome Church did, and, you know, it was all, like, you know, there were, like, a minimal table, and then it became, like, a table of abundance, and so, and it was amazing, like, people were singing and giving like homemade gifts and like found gifts and like just love and intention to this baby. But so she was born about eight years ago and she continues to be like a presence in the welcome church. And like her mother brings her to the events and the women take turns loving on this kid. Like the kid goes around and hugs everybody and you know, the women are aware of this child and they they treat her like they're a bunch of aunties, like it's like a family. And the little girl kind of runs and there's been several kids and like, it's just like they're welcomed into this like family of like people who are kind of like got their back and, you know, are holding their bags and like making, sh- and like someone's making homemade scarves for all of her little like, preschool classrooms and like you know I went to her she was like in a Christmas pageant or something and it's just like this little child was born into this you know this family of people who love her and I kind of feel like that's what the welcome church has been to me it's been like a family of people who kind of take care of you when life is hard and kind of rejoice with you when it's good you know like when you're having a baby and they're celebrating and then when you're sad there's people around you who care about you and care about your well-being and I I just was um, remembering another person who recently passed very sadly and like the stories coming from other people during bible study about this woman were so powerful and there was a connection like this person wasn't just a person without a house she was this person who wore a fur coat and like had connections and was a doctor and like you know she was important and like some one woman said oh I can't believe that I've known her for 13 years and I realized I had known her for that long too and that's a really long time like that's a that's a relationship and it was just like this person who you might not notice meant something to so many people like she was important and I think the welcome church is really about recognizing that importance that each person kind of carries in their own special way yeah so I'm very grateful for the welcome church me too so the book is Healing Chocolate Chip Cookies. Uh, keep an eye out for it coming soon. My guests have been Rachel and Pastor Seanal. Thank you both so much for Thank making you. time it's today. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We are the people who show up. Words to live by. If you'd like to find out more about The Welcome Church, you can check out our website at www.thewelcomechurch.org. If you'd like to attend a Sunday service, you can find us every month on the first and the last Sundays of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on the Ben Franklin Parkway in Aviator Park, just outside of the great steps of the Franklin Institute in Center City, Philadelphia. And there you have it. My thanks to my guests, Rachel Gutzwa and Pastor Seanal. I'm your host, Polly, and this has been Welcome Church Radio. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.